hardly a topic for laughing at. All right, welcome to the show, folks. Today we're talking to a very, very good friend of mine, a man I've known for, God, 25 years now. We're ancient. We're ancient. Anyway, it's Mr. Alan Averill, the lead singer from Ireland's most successful metal band, Primordial, and uh, a band I even had the pleasure of playing drums for on a European tour back in 2003. And not only are they Ireland's most successful uh, metal band, but they're also one of the most original metal bands in the entire world, a mixture of black metal, traditional metal, folk, and pagan metal. And uh, with traditional Irish music itself uh, sort of weaved into the entire thing, uh, Alan is a brilliant lyricist and probably one of the world's most charismatic front men. So I'm going to have a great time today because, you know, we're old mates. And uh, please welcome to the show, Mr. Alan Averill. I liked your Def Leppard reference off the top. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Uh, your, very... new, your new podcast channel. Well, here we go. Here we go, man. Here we go. An awful, lot of, an awful lot of platitudes just to open with. I'm not sure I can accept them all, but I'll 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 take them with um reasonable good grace that they're yeah, meant to yeah, yeah. I mean it's been we must have met must be like um like twenty twenty three or four well it must be twenty five years ago actually. Nineteen ninety nine man. Wow. And all because of uh pretty much because of a t shirt kind of thing. You were in Brussels, which was the rock bar in Dublin at the time, and you would come over to do comedy and you were staying in Balna Slow or something, wasn't it? With with Connor. Yeah. But, like, which is, um, okay, now, that's a very Irish thing to do is to drop names into a story that nobody else who has any concept of is going to understand the name. I, I was thinking that exactly. If you, if you want to know who Connor is, folks, Connor is the young Irish chap I met in Australia who I moved to Ireland with. Yeah, but no, but the point is, like, you were, you'd come over to Europe to do some comedy, but you were living in Balanced, which is the equivalent of, like, I suppose, being in, like, uh, Wyala from Melbourne or something like this. <laughs> Picked by Alan for a reason. <laughs> yeah, I know why. I know why. <laughs> and then we met you in Brussels with my mate, and then you told us, oh, yeah, I used to be in Slaughter Lord. And we were like, hang on, wait, what? Stop. Hang on. Pull the digger up, or pull the stopper, or whatever. Wait, what? And that was a sort of like, yeah, really? Slaughter Lord? And then, as they say, uh, uh, you know, a beautiful and less beautiful friendship evolved from that moment. But you were, I think you came back to a session in our house that night. And I think, what, like two weeks later, we're living on our couch somehow. I lived on that couch for like nine months. <laughs> so, I, so, 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 what the heavy metal world doesn't know is that I, I used to sleep on on the couch while Alan was playing uh, video soccer till four in the morning, and I'd be I'd be lying behind him like this, <laughs> trying to get to sleep while Paul Kearns was upstairs. Remember he used to put, put eggs in a cup in the microwave? But he wasn't doing that. For, well, he might have been doing that for more. Yeah, we, we lived in a kind of a DOS house, really. <laughs> we had a sort of heavy metal DOS house. I mean, like Simon lived there. Simon, he used to be in the Destroyer 66 for a while. He lived in that house. And like sometimes you'd come down on a Sunday morning and there'd be like 10 people asleep all around the floor and whatever. <laughs> and like we literally, well, that was the old sort of heavy metal way, though, wasn't it? You sort of met someone went, Hang on, you used to write to that person, you used to write to this person, or you're wearing a shirt. Like, I talked to Simon from Destroy because he's wearing a Sodom shirt. Well, yeah, but that was it, though. But I mean, that, you would wrote a, write a letter to somebody, or you'd meet somebody who knew somebody who's somebody, and all of a sudden, well, then you had to extend this sort of Masonic handshake of, right, you're living on our couch now. But really, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was, that, was, well, that's, that's, that, that's the scene that old metalheads miss when it was outside, as it was underground, and you just saw a guy in a Metallica shirt or a Maiden shirt, and you went like that from across the street, and they went like that, and you went, yeah. and there, there was a bond, you know, and that's yeah. that's what's funny about the, the new metalheads when they go, how can these old guys, yeah, they go on about this carry-on, because you don't know what you're missing. Yeah. You don't know what you're missing. And when Corn turned up with tracksuit pants and dreadlocks, it was all like, well, see... Hey, don't knock tracks and pants. But yeah, no, I know what you mean. But, but I think it's more like that we're one of the last generations um, or generations in and around, I suppose, mid-40s on who will have grown up before the internet, who would have been teenagers before the internet. And so obviously back then, I mean, I'm a little bit younger than you, but like um, everybody just wrote letters to each other. But there was that sort of thing. But the first time we ever toured in America or toured across Europe, even in the you know, late 90s and stuff, you'd meet somebody who'd go, I'm such and such who wrote you a letter in 93, you're staying in my house tonight kind of thing, you know what I mean? 
and you would continue that sort of pen pal friendship because that's what the old underground was kind of about. But it seems to be, it's not just heavy metal. I'd say that's kind of non-existent in such an atomized digital world that you don't really get that sense of that kind of same thing anymore. No, you don't get it. I think so. That's what I used to call type trading, the internet before the internet, done by yeah. sta- stamps and envelopes. Yeah, yeah. And, and it opened up Australia to being having access to the world because if we were in Slaughter Law, like we were in 85, 86, and we'd sent the demo made in a guy's garage to to Kerrang, they would have thrown it in the bin. But once but once we I could write to some guy called, you know, in a, in, in Cuba or Portugal or, or Sweden or somewhere, then it all opened up. I mean, I used to, the first fanzine I ever was in was was Violent Noise by that bar of, bar, whose name I could never say. Yeah, yeah. Horrible. Who who was who was you know dealing with Sepultura, bringing Sepultura all up to uh up to the states, and so you know it was all connected like this, and so I ended up you know knowing Metallion, who's who's famous in the black metal world, folks who put out Slayer Mag, yeah, and uh, you know it was yeah it was it was legendary. It was it was just a brilliant time, which which brings me because I I listen to your uh, going back to old school stuff. I listened to your review of the new Metallica record. Which I thought yeah. was a great review. In fact, you should be a record reviewer. You're really good at it. And uh, I was, it was spot on. In fact, I agreed with you on everything. The uh, the old albums. I mean, and, and and I even went back and listened to Kill 'Em All this morning because the drum sound wow. is excellent. I remember that drum sound. The toms, the snare, <laughs> like, and Kirk Hammett's yeah. leads are just blistering. Yeah, they're blistering on those first three records. And I'm like you. I don't like. I don't hate the black album. I was like, yeah, well, you know, it seems like a normal progression from Master of Puppets to me. That, that and Justice for All is that big mess in the middle, you know. Mess, yeah. Yeah, and then, uh, but yeah, you're right. Like I've, I've I've given load and reload re listens over the years to go. Okay, can I? Have I just missed? I liked Until It Sleeps. I thought it was an all right song. Yep, and I'm like, yes. and I'm like, I just. Ah, and then I loved your description of St. Anger. It made me laugh. The, 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 the album they had to do cathartically, but no one needed to hear. Oh, it's, just, it's just a therapy record, you know? It's a therapy record. It's like as if we used to do, it's like as if all of a sudden, remember, if we were up uh, some night at five in the morning and I had to sit there and watch you pace up and down in the front room and I went, wait a second, can we put it out as a podcast? Even your OC. Um, Steve's having a crisis of self-confidence. Let's film it and put it out. Straight away, Steve's undercooked neurosis, press it into a seven inch the next day. Okay. I mean, or you eat this piece of undercooked. Yeah, I mean, that that's what it was. But like, I think that old bands are, there seems to be a, a habit now amongst old bands, whether it's Candlemas or Destruction or Creator or whatever, that they, they, do be, they do find their way in a way back to the beginning. Yeah. Um, because they get lost in the middle somewhere. And I remember having a conversation with Millet from Creator, and he was like, basically, buddy, you know, kind of to paraphrase what he said, is like, oh, this is all I've known since I was 15. We went from selling 300,000 records to like 30, 40 with Endorama. What do I do? Do you quit? Do you give up? You've never had a job, job, maybe, you know, properly. What do I do? <clears throat> and <clears throat> you, we, we as metalheads, we take ownership of a logo, ownership of a band, ownership of things and then when we forget the fact that maybe until you're a little bit older you go okay maybe he was 43 and had no clue what to do um you you can let them step out from the timeline and you can step in afterwards you know and go all right we're now reacquainted again so maybe you don't have to you don't have to have saint anger in your collection but then you pick up the new one and when i heard the new one i was like okay i hate the drum sound i hate the tones but you know what it's got some it's got a little bit of no life to leather a little bit of no remorse in some of the songs and i thought all right so they found some of that old spark now of course nothing will ever be like it was but um you know but you're right you're right you know it's because i mean they've got a few load what's funny is is when death death magnetic is a nothing to me yeah yeah right sometimes it would kick in there was a riff that would kick in you go okay okay we've got it here and then for some reason it goes off into some Deep purple territory. Why, 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 why am I over here with this riff now? What's, what's, and as you said, exactly, I can't remember a thing off it. No, I can't. you can't remember a, a lyric, a line, or nothing, or whatever. But they, well, that's because Hetfield lost his way, didn't he? He went to kind of, he sort of went to, like, I'm a friend of mine loves some kind of monster. And I said, well, as a, as a piece of cinema, I get why you like it because it's engaging and it has jeopardy. 
But like as a Metallica fan, that was everything that we loved them for being, which was tough as nails, deconstructed right before our eyes. And you went, oh, my, here's my hero from when I'm 16. And here they are crying at the kitchen table about like to a therapist who's paying them 30 grand a month. And you want to go stomping such weak to you next Tuesdays, you know? And, and, and the choice of therapist. Oh, sorry. <laughs> And he's writing lyrics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you couldn't have got a more metal therapist. I mean, really. Think about this, he's he, he might have got. I need to check. Maybe he has some lyric writing credits. If he has a credit for writing those lyrics. He's getting a residual on the publishing. Mm. Anyway, anyway, it's like. I mean, I mean, with the creator stuff, I can. Publishing. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Not talk about lost publishing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with the with the old creator stuff going into a into like renewal, uh, renewal, which was I understand back then because you know metal wasn't so atomized into categories, and so and so especially when it was extreme. So you know you got Tom Warrior here, but you had Merciful Fate, but you had Voivod, but you had you know, and then punk was kind of crossing over, and so it was kind of all outlier music, and the idea of experimentation was quite ripe then, you know, because it it wasn't. Oh, it's a death metal, thrash metal, this metal, that metal. It was kind of, it was just a break away from the old traditional metal. And yeah. so, and I knew that he was very inspired by Voivod, you know, Mil Petrosa, and he probably liked the idea of it. Let's let's do a weird, and and, and also what you had, uh, industrial coming into it. I like the way that your modern, your modern reference for creator changing is uh, 32 years old. Yeah, yeah. But it's like, yeah. yeah. Also, Renewal could have worked, but the production. I liked it. I liked it. But oh, I no, I didn't like it. It's a killing joke, and there's a bit of helmet in there, but I think it's a good record. Uh, mm. it's, it's the production is too harsh. It's like terrible certainty. I can't get into it. Oh, I love it. <laughs> no, no, stop it with menace. I can't. I can't. It's it, it's really low on my. And then what happened after renewals? Ventors left. So like in any band that's got a big uh, career, they've they've got their dodgy era. Yeah. So at least Mil Petros is strong enough to keep the whole thing going. Rob Ferretti's left, Ventil's left. He pulls in these guys. He's on a subsection of noise records called Gun or something, and yeah, it comes yeah. out, and it's just not that good. And then he tried to do, what, the Endorama, which if you – it's just – it's doesn't it offend me. I don't think it's a sellout, but it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. I only offended you in, 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 uh, in the front room one time when we had an argument about it, probably in 1999. <laughs> <laughs> what Steve Hughes got offended? He's not allowed to get offended. He's the not offended yeah. comedian guy. But I think I deigned to like turn off Rush or something at like three in the morning in 1999. <laughs> yeah. At least you ended up liking them. So, True. And, so yeah. and so the funny thing with, with Creator is then they get back on board. What with it, they do Outcast, which is uh, and it's got some of their tracks they still play live, like Phobia and stuff like this. Yeah. But it's got a they get back on with Violent Revolution. Ah, there you go. And, and I respect created no end. I mean, they were they were my they were my favorite band in, back in Slaughter Lord days. But what I think, and and so the new stuff, I used to listen to it when when it started with what after Violent Revolution, you've got kind of what Hordes of Chaos. Hordes of Chaos is the next one, right? And then it's where that Finnish chap comes in. Oh yeah. And where, where he doesn't, bang, he doesn't bang the head that doesn't bang, does he? He well, what he does is, I guess Mil Petrosa wanted it. He adds that he adds that melodic element, but he puts yeah. these he puts flowery themes, as I would call them, like 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 Kirk Hammett used to put a sort of thing over the top, like in Ride the Lightning Day, and he puts them over the top, but they're but they're flowery. I can understand they're trying to to, to combine this this brutality with this melody, but sometimes I'd be going, it's 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 weakening the power with this with this. Yeah flowery thing and i'm just like be a bit tougher you know it's like the new record i mean i gotta respect him i love it ventor's what 55 he's still bashing the drums like a maniac and mil Petros is still they're still going hard so i respect him for, for forever and ever and i like some of the new album but the last track dying planet on the new one that's yeah. probably the best one on it, it even sounds like burzum sometimes that's when he puts it like there's a there's a no there's a burzum -y, burzum -y theme yeah. over the uh and I go, yeah, put more of that, not this flowery power metal stuff, you know. I wonder, was that the, the, the you know, you know the way when you're writing songs, before you've worked out the title, you have, like, pet names for them. I yeah. wonder, that, was that written on the whiteboard? Burzum theme. We've got to change it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so anyway, yeah. that's, 
let's let's instead of us being you just having a uh, uh, old school <laughs> oh, yeah. hat while people like, look at these two wankers going on for hours. Let's. I like to ask all the fans. So let's go back so they know a bit about you. When did you get into metal? Like, like obviously we all like music before metal. I get. I, I assume as kids, you know, you'd be. And then, uh, so what? 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 You didn't. No, no, no ABBA for you. <laughs> no, I, no, I'm. I'm actually. It's. <clears throat> I got into like my sort of musical consciousness seemed to come uh, online somewhere about 1983, and that was Easy Top Eliminator. My dad used to play it around the house, and he was listening to you know he liked you know Lightning Hopkins and um, John Lee Hooker and stuff and stuff. I started to become aware of blues. But then very quickly, ZZ Top Eliminator, then my uncle gave me a whole bunch of records somewhere around about 84, 85, maybe it was eight, nine or 10, <clears throat> which was UFO, Strangers of the Night, compilations with Maiden, with Sabbath, with Deep Purple, with Argent, with, uh, you know, Scorpions and stuff. And by <clears throat> 86, um, I was into Maiden and Priest, then Megadeth, then Slayer, so Venom, Dark Angel. Then by 88, I was tape trading and 87, Scream Bloody Gore. I was only like 12, 13, 14. So um, by 88, pestilence, bathory, death. So I never had a... <laughs> you got, you got, you're like Lewis, the guy I spoke to like the other day. <laughs> I remember buying Under the Sun, the Black Mark on cassette in the end of 87. Um, I never had, I never liked pop music. I never had any, any like, you know, a summer where I listened to what you could, you know, anything that wasn't heavy rock or pop music. I just yeah, literally right. went ZZ up. Um, Sabbath, Scorpions, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Slayer, Death, Morbid Angel, Demos, Thy Kingdom Come by end of 88. Um, and <clears throat> I, I was just only talking to my friend before this, and I said, like, I, whatever's happened to me, like, I, my listening tastes now are almost exactly the same as 1991. Um, I, she was telling me about some Joni Mitchell album. I said, look, I, I look, with all due respect to Joni Mitchell, I don't give a shit. <laughs> all I listened to was like, <laughs> Like, uh, all, all I listen to is extreme, brutal, violent, either that or drone scape, dark stuff, or maybe Towns Van Zandt or early 80s goth sort of um, post wave. But I have, I have no time for anything with any subtlety at all anymore. Um, oh, lockdown really? smashed the hole in my brain. Um, all I listen to is just super brutal death metal, ulcerate, whatever. I just couldn't <laughs> creaks me. Uh, well, I noticed last time I was when I was with you in Ireland, I came into your house and you were listening to Sargophago at five in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah. My listening tastes are pretty much, they've gone back to where they were in 88 to 92. Um, like, you know, I, somebody said to me, oh, you know, do you still have uh, Tori Amos Little Earthquakes on something? I went, no, forget it. Like, just even a right, yeah. li- Maybe. But like, I, and I would have given that a moment. It just came into my head. I, well, I would have given that a moment in 92 where I'd have gone, oh, an open-minded moment. I'm so close-minded now. All I listen to is just super brutal. All the time. Um, or what like about, I said. But, but what about old trad metal? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, but less so. Um, maybe it's because of, I think what happened is that during lockdown, I was so angry. And so off the ch- off the dial into deep into d- like deep dark water, and the only thing that I could listen to was just go 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 or like, um, I got really into like really strange drone scape sound stuff. But again, <clears throat> anything with any hope in it, we hate hope. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, <laughs> that's, a, that's what Henry Rollins used to say. I'm not into hope. The, yeah. Uh, um, so, like, that's what happened. And then, like, what happened is that my first school band was maybe end of 88. Um, we were called Cranial Slaughter. And we have never made a demo. We were just a bunch of kids messing around. And then I tried to play the bass and sing. And me and my friends did some, uh, like, I think, Discharge and GBH covers in the school in 89. Then <clears throat> I was in the sound cellar, the metal shop in Dublin, um, uh, we, where we all used to go in the end of the 80s. And one day I saw an ad on the wall and it said, um, Fingal based death metal band. Fingal is where the guys from Primordial are scaries and uh, looking for a singer. And I took down the number. And then about an hour later, somebody had put up a poster over it for some gig. And I rang up Paul, who's still the bass player and um, who, you know, and I was the only person who rang up and I went out. And of course I could, I was like, 
this is this is August, August the twenty ninth, nineteen ninety one, and I went, ah. but because I was wearing like a rotting cry shirt and had like super long hair, they just went, yeah, all right, you you you'll do, and oh, mate, that was that's the way. That's, yeah, and that's Kieran Paul, and me, uh, August ninety one, who are still the same three people, and then um, Simon joined in ninety six, ninety seven. Um, and that's sort of it. Um, we were they they they're playing together since November eighty seven, when they were twelve and like fourteen, and they made some demos in eighty eight. Actually, a death metal demo in eighty eight, but they never released it. And um, <clears throat> that's kind of how it went. And then you're starting a death metal band in Dublin in nineteen ninety one. So you know your main impulse is sort of we're underground kids writing letters and doing fanzines and stuff, is to try and find some way of making music. To cope with the state of the city in 91, you know, because the Dublin that you know now from visiting, of course, is a far cry from the Dublin of 1989 or 90 or 1991, which was... um, But it's a far cry from the Dublin of 1999 when I moved there. Yeah, or even 2009. Um, So, yeah, that's how it all sort of started. So, I mean, I got into hard rock super early, eight, nine years old. Like I said, by 11, um, was listening to, you know... Iron Maiden and Venom, and then by 13 was tape trading with writing to Yeah, Pest. right. Yeah, so I went very, I went very early, very extreme, and then sort of, and never changed pretty much. Well, see, that's good because you had someone to give you records. At 11, 13, I didn't have, you know, 12 years old. I was like, I think my stepmother's parents who lived next door for a time would buy us a Beatles or ABBA record every fortnight to share amongst my brother. And, and so... And we were in the Blue Mountains in the bush. We didn't, we didn't hear any heavy metal. Really. What's that spinal tap quote? We're swimming in a sea of retarded sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, my next question in that sense, because I never no, even I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never asked you this. Of all the years I've known you, why did you? Because, you know, I, I, was, I thought I wanted to play guitar first, but it was too hard for me to do this with my big blanky yeah, yeah. fingers. So I thought I'll play drums. So what made you go, I'm going to sing? Um, well, originally it wasn't. I mean, the first ever band I had when I was a, a, a little, like maybe 12, 13, um, we, like I said, we had two bands and we tried to play, we tried to rehearse and we tried to play Blitzkrieg Bop and Witching Hour by Venom, which is sort of the same song, actually. Uh, fifth, Seven Fret, Open, uh, whatever. Blitzkrieg and Bop, we, Ramones, is it? That's yeah, Ramones. that's the same song as Witching Hour by Venom. Oh, is it? Right. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's the same notes. Anyway, whatever. So we tried to play that. And I w- just was the de facto singer because I could make, I was even worse at everybody else than playing. <clears throat> and like I'm playing the bass for years and years and years, and I'm still a pretty awful. But it, I just ended up being by sort of default the singer. And then when I answered the primordial ad, the intention in, the, in 91 was that you're going to learn the guitar to be the rhythm guitar player singer. And then very quickly, it became very obvious that um, everybody else's expertise um was well beyond my capability um you know <clears throat> like if i was going to try and catch up and then i just sort of uh, i mean i can play the guitar a bit now and i can play the bass but it became very obvious that like if you're going to be a particular kind of front man you're not a guitar playing front man you have the freedom with your hands you know that the david coverdale Carl mccoy thing and um that just sort of appealed to me and then i just fell away from the idea fell away from being just the singer so and then you are just the singer, even though you have the intention of adding, like, I don't come into Pony and go, here, Kieran, here's my shit riff. Dun, 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 <laughs> you don't fix what's not broken. Yeah, yeah. And so it became that thing. I just ended up becoming, <clears throat> um, yeah, you're just the singer. Um, I don't know. It wasn't my intention. I don't know. Like, why? Like, did you did you mess about with the guitar before you picked the drums, or was it you just always wanted the drums? No, I knew a guy. I knew these two guys, these two English guys. One of them was this kind of a uh, friend of my father's, uh, the son of the friend of my father's, and the other guy was his next door neighbour, who was this sort of early gothy punk guy that used to have earrings when we were kids, and he he had a weird hairdo, and he used to he used to walk, and his arms didn't move, and he's and so so he's the guy that I used to hang around, and he's he's the guy that showed me all like post punk and. Punk and oh, yeah. Susan and the Banshees, and and he was in the sort of new romantic that was hitting the world, Human League, and all this, and yeah. Ultra Vox, and and we'd sit up and watch these music shows together, and smoke cigarettes, and and uh, 
he hated metal. I never really heard of metal, but I knew he didn't like it. And then I, that's when I saw Run to the Hills. I went, sook. Yeah. Right. And then, uh, great. I don't have to try and pretend to like half these jam songs I don't really like. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so that, so with those two guys, I, one of them started to play guitar and he used to muck around on bass. And I thought maybe I could learn to play guitar. And I was like, you, I was just my talent. And then they went, well, just get a drum kit. And I went, all right. Yeah. And so <laughs> I got a drum. So I was like you in the sense of what I, per- I didn't get a drum kit and learn drums. I got a drum kit and joined a band with two other guys who couldn't play. And we sat there like not being able to play. Right. So, so my whole intention was just to be in a band immediately. You know, that was, that was why I got one. And, uh, then I just became obsessed, basically, like you. It seems the drums are weirdly right. They seem so they're so primal, but yet there seems something really intellectually counterintuitive about it. In that, to be a good drummer is, I think, to be even more complicated than being a good guitar player because you're talking about the movement of you know both arms and both legs doing like totally different things, different rhythms, different whatever. The brain has to work a certain particular way to be really good at the drums, whereas. I'm a reasonable bass player. I'm not a good musician at all. But being good at the drums, but you pick it up in the beginning because it's just hitting things where it has a very primal sense yeah. to it, but yet it's quite a very clever, intellectually minded yeah. thing. That's a Do great that's to- a great observation because that's why I could start it because I could start it quick. Whereas yeah. try, trying to make my fingers go, now go like that, make the little yeah. one go. I was like, right. Because listen to it, League with Satan. And you can tell they've written the song because he doesn't know, well, what's that? Like that. That's going to be a really fast beat. Just go. And you can hear him opening the hi-hat going in the beat. You can tell that's like, you. I can't play the drums. I'm just going to do this. You know? Ah. Not. You know, but it's it's it, it is it's always fascinating me because I sometimes I watch a really good drum and you go, yeah, you know, and they've got their feet doing the totally different thing to this, and it's um and counting at the same time. Yeah. Uh, well, it was a, it's a, and I think also <clears throat> that's where I get my love of starting bands and not being able to play because when I started Slaughter with Mick, Mick was already a good guitarist, but 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 that's yeah. where me and him used used to clash because he he lacked the emotional import that i wanted because it was like, well you can't do that because it's a rule and I, I, I and i worked out that it was great to have a guy that knew how to get around the fretboard yeah but then but then i was like when like when the endless playing creator came out i could tell the guys that couldn't get into it because they didn't think it was good enough in the sense of music but i was like what are you talking about the entire thing yeah. is on fire right and so yeah. and so to this day i like i still like that like like that tom warrior we've got here that that the use of primal simplicity and, yeah. and an s and if you can write a song with like two notes I mean, some of my Turnham songs, you know, I can't play guitar. They're one string and they've got three riffs and the whole thing, but it goes for seven minutes and no one notices because I know how to do it. Yeah. You know, and I love that primal simplicity. It was one of the first things that we we first ended up drinking at a party back then was like listening to In the Sign of Evil. And that just has this incredible primal energy to it, you know. Mate, I st- that's still my favorite Sodom record. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. With a great drum sound. And people go, oh, I don't like yeah. the drum <laughs> The drum, that's what that's maybe their best drum sound ever. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And it's like the snare on Endless Pain. The snare on yeah. Endless Pain is just power packed, right? The Pulcro voice has a better, uh, the, the drum sound is better than Prescription Mania on that record. Oh, much better. Yeah. Ten yeah. times better. But it is interesting, though, because. So, well, like, hang on. This is very interesting that you, oh. this, this is what I love too, because you, you're on the unknown as one of the, you know, every comment section I've been going through your albums. <clears> I'm like, <throat> Every comment section, and you're known for the, you know, the passionate singing, the 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 epic singing. You're known as one of the greatest singers in heavy metal now, and I love that the fact that you came from guys who went, "Well, I can't play guitar, so I better do this." Right? <laughs> That's what I love about the underground, you know. And, oh well, I'll just do that because I can't do that. But now you're known for one of the, you know, and and I know you're Irish, so you're gonna it'd be hard to take a compliment, but it's like you are, you know, you, it's. Yeah. it's you, you read the comments. I mean, still, you, you listen to Coffin Ships, which is the track, folks, the probably the fourth or fifth track off your fifth album, is it? Uh, Gather- uh, Gathering Wilderness. Yeah. Gathering Wilderness, which is another area I want to go in because I met you around, you were doing Spirit the Earth of Flame. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the third album, which I still think. And then you did Storm Before Calm, 
which is the kind of maybe it's a, that's the transitional record with the shitty cover. That's what I was going to say. It's what I wrote down yeah. here. Storm, but uh, uh, the spirit, the earth, the flame. What have you got before that? Journey's end in Imrana. Yeah, yeah. Journey's end, um, uh, and an EP called the Burning Season. Burning Season, which we played some of those tracks on the tour. Yeah. And so, and I still love, you know, the soul will sleep on the on on spirit, the earth, yeah. the flame. One of my favourite songs to play, and God's the Godless, which is still live yeah. in in your set. Yeah, I still do that too. And so, yeah, then and then you do have that. That is like this transitional album because because the change in the Gathering Wilderness that's that to me that's like now primordials turned into primordial on the Gathering Wilderness. Yeah, yeah. the change is so monumentally, like like. Bang! It's like the soul of Primordial's been born on that record. Like, like it's 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 just matured into this. Bang! Here it is. Here it is. Well, I, I think the thing with <clears throat> excuse me, got that out. I think the thing is that uh, when when you're going to be the singer or the voice or whatever, um, I think you need to be a couple of different things at the same time. And that you know the technical stuff doesn't never really interested me that much. Although I would like to be considered a reasonable singer or a, a good singer, but that wasn't that the most important thing. I think the most important thing for me was always <clears throat> to be able to impart the meaning and the diction and the whatever, like, if, you know, like right straight to the heart of the matter. Even if you could speak English or not, you understood, you know, I am, you know, where is the fighting man? I am he. The, the glory of a huge chorus in the sense that you can be part hooligan, part poet, part rabble rouser, Art, you know, you need to be a whole bunch of different things. You can be intellectual if you want. That's a great you description. Know, people can scrape the surface with it, but you also need to be a hooligan. You know, if you're going to be live and heavy metal, like, come on, let's go. You need to be part primal. And right. so it's the all those things. So you, And that's, that's the beauty about old heavy metal, which we've talked about to death to the long hours, is that if you take the first Wasp album, which is, you know, I want to be somebody, be somebody too, and you go... That has a gonzoid beauty that's like like those old, you know, um, William Burroughs or something like it's it's such a an explicit way of saying I'm going to make my try and make my way to the top. And I'm, and all those the beauty about all those old heavy metal bands we love is they never second guess themselves. They're like, we're going to we're going to we're going to do this. Right. And so you need to capture that. So you, that means you have to be in the bubble of understanding that, but also to be clever enough to step outside a moment and go, that's why it's beautiful. That's why Wasp is beautiful. And if, if you're too clever or you're too conceited, you'll never understand the primal beauty of sepulchral voice. You know, I have I mean? to, I, oh man, and I have to, because what you talk about wasp is I want to be somebody. And I was just doing, because I've been listening to Old Man of War lately, right? I've gone back to the first four. Yeah. And and, and, lot, and lots of people used to, you know, call them corny and laugh at them. You know, got a bunch of, if you don't know who Man of War folks is, they're the guys who invented Viking metal out of New York. You would have thought Scandinavians did it, but a bunch of muscle bound, oiled up New Yorkers did. And, and when I first, and I didn't even think it was silly. I was 16. I saw him there with swords. I thought it was great because what he said exactly, it inspired me to go, you do whatever you want. Yeah. Right. You express yourself however you want. And when you had songs like Mountains on Sign of the Hammer, which was an yeah. absolutely inspirational song, you know, like a man is a mountain. Greatness waits for those who try. Right. Yeah. And but what else? What is the other song that is? There's so many songs. That's the beauty of that old heavy metal. And it's, you pick Man of War, the beauty of battle hymns or something is that it's almost, it's so relentless in its pursuit of uh, single mindedness. And that's what oh, I like about it. Totally. Like it, has, it has an orthodoxy to it um, that is, like, to me, singularly very sort of beautiful mm, in its way. Totally. It doesn't, it doesn't go, here's something that you might think is funny. So therefore, it'll appeal to your narcissistic modern. Uh, you know, age, like you go and watch some nonsense metal band now that are full of, you know, people go, oh, you go and see, well, I'm not going to name a name, but I think you can think of the names that I mean, a modern band and go, oh, do you like Man of War? Is that not the same thing? And you go, no, because this is conceited. This is narcissistic and this is selfish and this is, you're in on an in-joke. Now, in 1981, 82, with heavy metal, whether it was Twisted Sister or Wasp or specifically Wasp, let's pick them, you're not in on an in joke. You're in on an actual, like a, a white knuckle ride, like a raw adrenaline, you know, thing. And that's that 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 beauty of that old heavy metal is that it it didn't live in it didn't exist in a world where, um, <clears throat> let's say, intellectual conceit was one of its main pursuits. And you have to be clever enough to be to step outside that to understand it. 
that the reason it was like that was because it was so singular. Um, and that's what's lost on many people. I don't know if I explained that properly, but no, no, I, it's, it's brilliant. It's like it's like when you say you're in on an in joke. It's like when I used to go, you know, when people outside of metal used to laugh at metal. I go, no, 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 we can laugh at the aspects yeah. of metal that's stupid, yeah. but you can't because you don't respect the parts of it that yeah. are brilliant, even though it looks a bit silly, right? It's po poetry and primacy, or like primitivism, and you know, uh, potential or something, if you want, like this, and and just to you just. To never second guess, to just go bum. So with Primordial, my intention was always, <laughs> if you wanted some clever metaphors or wanted some intellectuality about whatever the things I was thinking about, you could find it, but never to dress it up too much, which is what I learned, to be able to go, <clears throat> you know what, where is the fighting man? You know, to make it so that in a room full of 5,000 people, when you say that, they go, oh, I got that. Same with coffin ships. You don't have to understand English to understand, oh, this is tragedy. This is, there's something tragic happening. And so that's, um, the Primordial straddles a couple of different, um, you know, <clears throat> sort of monolithic in that sense. It sort of strafes a whole bunch of different things in the sense that if somebody doesn't understand Primordial, the, doesn't understand the lyrics or the imagery or whatever, it's fine. But you can, you get the emotional impact and resonance because it doesn't need to be in your language. And so to be able to, figure out a way of getting that message across, but also being clever for the people who want the clever thing. And also to let the clever people know there's a beauty in the primacy of it as well. And so that's what I think about all the time. No, the that's, uh, that's fantastic because that's, 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 I'm glad I asked you that question. It's a, it's a brilliant description. And I was like, I was watching a bit of the, uh, <clears throat> the primordial documentary again, I've seen that a few oh. times and I thought I'd catch up on a bit. So you get a bit of info and I was, it was really great. I've forgotten that bit how 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 smart uh, Leary is talking about the drums. Yeah, like you know, a way back forward. Yeah, and really adding that you know not just making it this this, but adding the flams and the space, and then moving it so it moves. And I thought, yeah, this is really really cool. I forgot about that bit. He's a, I'm doing a bunch of drummers. I was thinking I might get him on. Uh, yeah, he'd do it. Did you count the amount of pints uh, Kieran drinks in his interview? <laughs> Every because lots of cuts, and so he's looking looking at the floor for a while, trying to read something on the floor, and it just looks like every time I finish answer a question, his pint goes Broop, like down to the end. <laughs> well, Kieran loves doing interviews, doesn't he? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't stop me doing it on my own, but it's like <laughs> he, he must have thunk like fourteen pints or something in that afternoon, and they just keep going. Broop, broop. <laughs> So which yeah. let's let's have a look because I want to go and do after what you've got the Gathering Wilderness, then we go into what album? Um Gathering Wilderness, then we have to the name is Dead, which is the big one. So that's that's bang. Because because the the as much as you've got you've got a major label sort of a, or a proper label yeah. on the Gathering Wilderness, that's that's every song's like nine minutes. Yeah. Gathering Bleak. The Nameless Dead is a bit more a tight production and it's one with much more hits. It wasn't intentional, but it well, it's just got Ryan Burns on it. Yeah, it's got Empire. One of my, one of my favorite, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's like got Coffin Ships. It's got Gallows Hymn, it's got Trader's Gate, Nation of the Earth. And that sort of moved us into being from on the third stage at 6 p.m. to the end of the second stage to the beginning of the first stage. And it sort of moved us in from the periphery, from the outside. And then we made Redemption, the white one, um, which I really like that, that one. Is that, is that Redemption at the Puritan Hand? That's, uh, yeah, I knew you'd like that one. That one I found a little tough to get into at the start. Like it's a, it's a ragged, abstract yeah. bash around the head kind of, oh, hang on, this is a, this is a tough one. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of an album about um, faith and religion and um, maybe an album that I wrote before I was old enough to fully grasp a hold of it, you know. The idea that you have some sort of um you you have a small bit of um jealousy for people who have their religious faith you know because you don't have any and it should be something you maybe get to when you're 50 or 55 maybe not 31 or whatever <laughs> but i think i was probably born old so you know it was about time i wrote that one and then yeah. you have a great amount of fallen which i really i really like that one a lot right, that that, tr that track itself that title track. Oh. 
That's a, that's then, a monster. I've just skipped over about five albums then. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's, um, I think what it is is that you're not, we were never caught in this cycle of making albums so that we didn't have to do one every year. We couldn't have done anyway. We weren't, we weren't making a living from it. We weren't making money from the band. We never really did. Um, so we weren't professional. So there, there was no manager going, hey, 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 it's about time to get back in the studio. So sometimes it would take two, three years. Sometimes take four years. Sometimes take five. Um, and, you know, because it was always sort of, you know, uh, quality over quantity. Well, at least we would think so. And we're always we were always like super harsh on ourselves, biggest critics. And so um, we would never let anything kind of go, eh, well, I don't know about this bit. And we would drop whole things pretty quick, quickly and easily. But, you know, at this, this is the kind of stage where we sort of had a very great handle on what the sound of Primordial was. And so, and then there's a the moment where you're going to go, you maybe you're as big as you're going to get. You're as big. It's not going to get any bigger because the band, the way the band is, is not really constructed for to get to that other other level. Some people say to me, "Oh, you never got to the level above the where you are." And you go, "Well, I'm not sure we were going to ever going to be able to." Um, not without relentless touring, which of course was maybe impossible. But like, um, it just it is what it is. And, the and also, that- oh, sorry, and also it's it's it's. It's it's real music. I, I mean, what did you say the other day? It, it related to me completely, you know, in, in that, which is, uh, you know, one of the reasons we're not more popular is, you know, because it's real. And, and the world is a dark place, and I think we align with that, expressing that. And uh, no one's no one wants to know that all the time, you know. It's a, it's a, it's a lot easier to just go and listen to fun, fist-in-the-air metal, yeah. which I, I think we- I, I had that issue with comedy. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, like, you know, you like I remember we had a conversation about it before and you said, well, I went to see some comedy thing here and you said, how was it? And I said, well, there was a woman with a yoga mat laughing. So, no, it wasn't funny. <laughs> but it doesn't work. No, it's, it's, I mean, you choose, you choose, a, you choose a tighter path when you decide I, I want it. I, I, I've got the heart. Yeah. You know, you know. Well, you, these things thrive in dark places. That's because they're. You need them to answer to to like, with, at least with my understanding of comedy is that I liked my comedians fucked up and oops sorry or or I liked it dark or whatever you want to say because that you needed it to be like that to deal with what comedy was designed to deal with. I mean, who wants you know like comfortable middle class comedy? Well, you know it's the same with heavy metal in the sense that old that old heavy metal, <laughs> wasn't, but like primordial for me was sort of this has to be relentlessly dark. Because that's the way our history is, and I continue to see Primordial as a continuation of Irish literary and musical tradition, which is steeped in sorrow and tragedy, but also, you know, epicness and you know, might and resistance and all whatever. So that's how it has to be. If I if I got to fifty five, I used to say this when I was twenty five, and now that nearly I'm you know, say seven years away from fifty five. If I wasted my life singing about like fast cars and beers and whatever, I mean. You know, and somebody goes, well, what did you do? Yeah, it seems a bit empty. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. It's it's like my, it's like, it's like my, oh, sorry. Well, at least you made, a, you made a stand for something that meant something. And um, you never intended it to be the biggest thing or the thing that, you know, allowed you to buy a house or whatever, all these things. If that happened, you know, okay. Plenty of dark things became big throughout throughout time. But the way the world was set up now in the last 20, 30 years, I mean, the idea that Primordial was going to be headlining um, big festivals and being paid, it's, just, it's never quite, it was not going to work out like that. But you know what? We were on stage two at 8 p.m. All right. You know, and we made it after through 30 years. But like, you know, yourself, um, comedy works in dark places because it's the antidote to that. Because people need to laugh at it. At least that's how I see it. And so um, I think the, uh, the music I would gravitate towards was was the same thing that totally. I, I didn't need i don't i mean comedy and music or light relief i don't need that um you know and that's a difference people think when they hear like a joke stupid band um let's pick it uh, for the sake of purposes of the conversation ailstorm or something they think oh that's the same as wasp you know it's not it's not the same as wasp because there's a 40 50 year gap of culture there where, where societies change a lot where one thing 
um, you know, it's the honesty of intent or whatever you want to call it. And then, as I said, this you're part of an in joke. You know, I'm going. You're going to get tons of Ale Storm fans in the <laughs> comment section. <laughs> They're good guys, you know, and they wouldn't pretend to be neurosis or whatever. But um, the point is that I think that, they, you know, there's answers to these things in modern society gives us. But they, um, as you say, the the refusal to deal with the nature of the world head on. I understand that. because Not everybody wants bad news all the time. Oh, no, um, I understand it, too. I understand sometimes light relief is needed. You know, sometimes you need to put on Seinfeld or... Father Ted or or you know, yeah. Buffy the Vampire Slayer just to just to just to go okay well you know whatever just just take me away from the nothing yeah. from the I mean mentioning neurosis as you just did I mean you can't I went we saw neurosis in Dublin yeah, that yeah. time and that, they played yeah. for about three hours by the time you got out of there you, yeah you're like battered around the head with psychic video, psychic video, sonics you know videos of people just shoveling corpses into graves behind them. <laughs> yeah, I, know. It was just, yeah. I, I came out of there psychically and spiritually exhausted. Like, whew, I was like, that's what you want, you know? Now, I understand not every day can be like that, but you make your division. If you want, if you want entertainment, fine. You like it. You want to be entertained. That's okay. But then it, I'm not sure it gives you the, you know, to then go and criticize something that's art. You know, um, let's say art and entertainment. You know, um, you you can be entertaining without being a, without being an entertainer. Um, and going to see a band who are artistic can also be entertaining, but they're not entertainers. Yeah, I know um, exactly what you mean. So, if you just like music that's superficially entertaining, that's okay. But you don't get to judge the new Neurosis album or no. whatever it is. You know, you don't. I'm sorry, we have to make some divisions in how these things go. And that's, people say, oh, isn't heavy metal a bit elitist sometimes? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah, of course. Like, totally. <laughs> just, just like a folk metal scene or jazz or whatever. Or, you know, like country and western, like the new country. The stuff that's on the, that's huge. It's horrible. Yeah. And if I say, somebody, well, I personally like Towns Van Zandt. And they go, oh, yeah, who's Towns Van Zandt? And they go, look, well, if that's the question, you know, we have yeah. an answer. I, know, I mean, it, it all ties into what this PC stuff is, which is just taking all the like me and Thomas Sheridan were discussing. You know, the shadow. You can't, you can't, you can't face the shadow or do anything that's you know. In this polarity of light and dark, we've all got to go over to the light now and pretend that everything's just shiny. That, but it's all, it's even, it's so robotic and fake. It's so dangerous to me. Like, like it's why. Yeah. That's why I got into the PC comedy. Uh, getting into uh, attacking PC early because I couldn't work out how anyone couldn't. Excuse when when a bunch of people turned up in the two thousands going oh we're gonna maybe be able to arrest you if you upset someone I'm like I'm like I like didn't it, didn't it, how come now everyone in the world's got a podcast about it and they're all intellectuals discussing it I'm going how come I was just listening to Black Sabbath and running around and how come you didn't say anything then no one likes and I told you so but I'm sitting there going I'm no genius or or, or intellectual but excuse me. Well, I, I mean, I think that what's happened is that, I mean, it's very complicated, but it's just the last 10 years has been the sort of inculcation of people's, um, you know, narcissism into what, you know, you would you call it virtue signaling or whatever that um, sort of allows them to take the um, these sort of drastic moral decisions that they don't realize echo uh, throughout this you know, sort of authoritarian holes of eternity. And the idea that you have to support the people you dislike in their ability to say what they want because otherwise eventually it'll come for you and that's one of the things that people who are uh you know the sort of unwitting fools or whatever you want to call it you know the useful idiots as yeah. Mao would have said in this in this war in parenthesis and um, they don't really realize that eventually it comes for them anyway oh, like, totally you, you, you're not going to decide you know eventually it will come for the comedy you like and music you like and you know, it's um, it's uh, yeah. We talked about this twenty, twenty five years ago. Um, I mean, quite a few people could see it coming, could see what was going to come. You know, <clears throat> but and also, what I think is very dangerous is, uh, especially you know, like like primordial lyrics, primordial songs. Right? They go, they go back into what? They go back into the collective psyche of 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 the tragedy about the nation itself. So, a group of people, your forebears, yeah. have gone before you, right? So, what they went through, so. So you're still connected psychologically, spiritually, to your forebears, 
And when I see that these young kids have been, have been, uh, you know, let's go and tip statues over and say all this and do that. Not only have they turned them into these psychological foot soldiers or useless idiots, but to me, I think that the greater damage is it, they're giving them a sense of self-loathing, but not only into themselves and their own culture, but they have no respect or gratitude to their to the spiritual connection, the psychic connection to their forebears who have gone before them. So it's almost like a psycho spiritual genocide. Well, okay, let's say let's unpack that. I think. I, I don't think you're wrong. I would use maybe slightly different words, but I think what it I think maybe what I would say is that we've taught people to be citizens of nowhere. Yep. Great description. Instead of citizens of somewhere. And citizens of nowhere. That's a great description. <laughs> when you're when you're a citizen of nowhere, you can be pulled up from your roots very easily. Totally. You can you can be taught um, you know, that two and two equals five or whatever else, you know. Um, a citizen of nowhere is very malleable and easy to control and is easy to rail. I mean, I think most of the culture war stuff is just classic divide and conquer from the, you know. The yeah, but, yeah, totally. We're arguing about, like, you know, nonsense. But most, yeah. most of them, because that's, they've designed it this way to keep people distracted and keep people at each other's throats. But yeah, citizens of nowhere. And so therefore you're taught to hate, as you say, your ancestry, your history. Um, for all history, for all its you know, um, dark and light is, is what's, you know, standing underneath us. And if yeah. you're completely uprooted from that, um, yeah, you become, as I said, uh, and that's what the, we've talked about this before, but that's kind of what the global is. And I don't like necessarily using that word phrase generally, but that's what the global ideal is to make us citizens of nowhere. Yeah, and um, like a, like a, like a, like well, it's like year zero, isn't it? It's a boring communist saying, but like bang, you cut off the past, yeah. and we start we start today. Yeah, that's, and so a great description. You're a citizen of nowhere now, you know. Yeah, and when you're a citizen of nowhere, then why would history be important to you? Because yeah, why would any of these things be of any importance, or they don't? Why would you care about the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, and if you've been taught? as people have done for the last while, that every part of your ancestry is something negative, um, then why wouldn't you want to burn the entire house down? Yeah, completely. Um, you know, and I have speak to young people about this concept before, and I mean, I don't necessarily blame them. I think that's too easy of an age thing to do. But when you look at some of the things they're being taught... Um, <laughs> I, blame, it, I blame the school teachers who did it to them. <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, there's there's lots of different things. Again, I I think that um, I think the world is a chaotic place whereby finding a linear structure or finding nodes of influence or whatever you want to say, people like to, we, it's our nature to try and find meaning on this rock that's hurtling through space. And sometimes I think that there's some, to just give in to the idea that some things, some things are just chaotic. And instead of there being one grand narrative, maybe there's 50 competing narratives which converge and coalesce into this seems like the most dominant narrative at this moment, and it might swing another way. But <clears throat> I, I kind of subscribe to that. But at the same time, it is clear to me that many of these converging um, ideals are pushing this sort of, as you say, this narrative of um, uprooting people and telling them that their um, ancestry or history has no meaning or that um, their history is negative or that or you know which is a really you know facile and sort of evil claim is that um your ancestor you know and you have inherited guilt your ancestry people huh. you never who have no connection to you are responsible for x and y um which is you know the idea that somebody from your well, guess, that goes right into Chris, christian thinking too <laughs> you know? yeah I mean, isn't that's what well, inherited what, sin through birth so. that's that's original sin. We're from. The, I'm from the country that you know. I mean, if there was an if there was an original sin Olympics, we'd be we'd get the gold medal, you know, of of, of guilt. But, <laughs> you know, we do we do pretty well in the paedophile Olympics as well. But, uh, <laughs> we, beat, we beat Belgium in the final on penalty. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> anyway, cut that out if you want. No, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's really, it's just orthodoxy, which states that you have inherited original sin, 
And like I've had this conversation with people in America and they've said to me, and I've gone, look, I'm I'm Irish. If you want to play that game, we can go into Irish history. The idea that the whole of the West and all of Europe, whether you're from Belarus, Finland, Portugal, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Serbia, uh, and that everyone has a blanket original sin of history is just patently wrong. It's just historically inaccurate and it's just um, it's a pernicious myth that yeah, people, yeah. people who are historically illiterate just keep repeating. But I, I've had conversations with people that have gone, you know, we've talked about things and I said, OK, that's not true. And here's why. And I've looked at them and gone, you're going to say the same thing tomorrow, aren't you? Oh. you know, doubling down is a is a virtue. Man. So, Man. But that but that first creator album, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Feel the endless pain. Yeah. <laughs> right. Breaker is a is an underrated one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, yeah, it's, but it's, um, but it's true. And it's not just about what you said about five minutes ago, where there's an amal amalgamation of different things converging. It's it's almost, I guess, if I'm correct in that understanding of it, it's like it's like what Thomas Sowell said. You know, Thomas Sowell, that black guy, as he said, you don't get solutions, you get you get compromises you need to keep this stable for the time being before it all falls no apart in a different way, you know? No solutions, only compromises. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, say, you if you take the, you know, there's how many how many books have been written about why did the First World War start or the First World War? And there's never one outright answer. I mean, okay, Gabriela Princip, member of the Serbian Black Hand, shot Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo. And that was kind of like the tipping point. But at the same time, in my chaotic theory of the world Gabriella Prince have got two goes at him he came round the hill and came back down in, in, in what structured world of yeah, pyramidical pyramidal structure of a world do you get does the assassin get two bites of the cherry or two <laughs> bites of the, the duke you know it do, it's the world is way too chaotic for there to be a particular structure I think but yet at the same time this 17 year old guy killed him and pushed everything over the edge into the First World War. But is that the moment? Or is it one of a preceding points of light, 10,000 moments to that point? I mean, so I, I, I like to drag almost every argument into the gray area in the middle, which I, I understand is really frustrating for people because they want a sexy answer. They yeah, want yeah, yeah. Because, because of that. Whereas I go, how about we talk about the 100 reasons in the middle that get so frustrating and will just, you know, break your brain because <laughs> people want like just one sentence of, a, of an answer. Yeah, um, but, sound but, yeah, but how did the First World War start is very, very complicated. And um, that 10,000 historians have failed to fully answer ish. Of course, it's many different things. So I kind of believe that there's a back, there's a backstory of, of something like that to almost everything. So you know, I, I'm, and, and when you look at young people and the way they relate to phones and technology and how it's if you if you're 18 now, it means you've had you've been from eight to 18 with a phone in your hand yeah. telling you that, um, you know, the, the as I said, the narcissistic digital impulse of everything you've ever thought is worth something. But also the fact that you're living externally, not internally, everything you're doing, you, you, you're living in a movie version of your life with you as the main character without with a let's say a lack of hubris is hubris the right word lack of understanding to kind of step outside and go i'm not the main character someone has to stack the shelves do you know what i mean oh. we're living in this strange society where um well it's it's like when they go to video when they go to gigs and they film them sure and i sit there and they're all standing there like this and they're looking through this thing and they're, they're probably never going to watch it anyway but i sit there and i think to myself but you're going to even if you did watch it you're going to go home now and watch an experience that you didn't have well, it's you see, Steve, I would have said to you that eight, nine, ten years ago, they were filming that for that. Now they're not. Now kids are filming it and they're live streaming it to say, I'm here right now. As in, my life is better than yours because you're not here. Um, but yet it's you're not. But the point is, it, the point I'm is, you, you're not. The band is here. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's the thing that we don't understand, right? And I, I, I've, I've begun to think about it a bit like this, is that music for some young people is um, it is the backdrop to their life. It's not the soundtrack to their no, life. No, 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 completely, completely. Backdrop. It's what 
is happening in the background while they are doing other things and they are the star. Whereas, so if you in 1987, you were feeling, uh, I don't know, let's say you were particularly feeling a bit isolated, feeling a bit depressed, feeling a bit down. Robert Smith spoke for you. Morrissey spoke, spoke for you. Um, James Hetfield, whoever. Now, kids don't have that identification with anybody speaking for them. They or other kids who are the same age as them are speaking for them. Like they say, there's this, there's this I was reading this thing where somebody was saying that the first time ever in history, kids are getting most of their social, cultural, moral and historical cues from other kids, not from adults. They're no, listening to what kids are telling them or right. Chinese. And now, they're, and, now, and, now they're, and now they're bringing kids in to tell adults what to do. Yeah, well, you see, that's, I mean, that's, yeah. this is like, you know, the Greta Joan of Arc story. I mean, I think that's all about optics, because if you have an agenda that you want to put to the United Nations, how better, what better way to do it than to tell, to send a kid, who I feel sorry for, by the way, um, send a kid in to do an adult's job, because no adult will risk that 30 second bit where they tell a kid off. Are online because the optics of that are so terrible. It's like a Trojan horse of an argument that's sent in to um, render all the adults in the room impotent. Oh, that's how I see it. And I feel sorry for her, by the way, <laughs> but because she obviously has some issues. But like, I, <laughs> I probably could, but it's that head on her. I can't get over it. I, 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 it it's I, I, every t first time I saw her, I thought that the fellow that made Lord of the Rings had left a cage open for one of his extras and it had scuttled out and made its yeah, way to. <laughs> it made, it's, made its way to to the UN and bleh. yeah. Well, I, but you know, but I think that I think that I think her, <laughs> it is a good joke. <laughs> I think that she was carefully constructed in order. Oh, come off come, come, completely. But in that sense, though, like I mean, um, like we come back to the music or whatever. Like I said, in 1987, 88. Who spoke for you when you felt like an outcast? And that was Robert Smith speaks for me. I'm a goth. I'm a curehead. And that's why I think sometimes when you see young people, they seem so optically uniform because they don't identify with a subculture anymore. Um, no. And it seems to be, it's very sad, of course. We grew up in a time when there was goths and cureheads and punks and straight edge people and garage rock people and psych rock people. And, you know, somebody handed you, as you said, the Susie and the Banshees album and went, Listen to this in 1988 or Minor Fred or Black Flag. I think that all of that is just a, rom a romantic myth that's about to be buried in our heads. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't exist anymore. And like it's 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 technology. It's te it's technology that is the cause of this. So I, I, I kind of have quite a reasonable amount of sympathy for young people. But I blame the people above them for not teaching them the principles of free speech or the principles of debate or the principles of, um, you know, all of these things when, you know, teaching them like, yeah, this is the best way to get your way. And that Which is, is a great lead in to talking about, <clears throat> although we may have missed a record, but, but, but that new record, which seems to me that's very what that yeah. the lyrics on this new record are about, which is this lack of, lack of rebels. It's yeah. a great, there's a great line in that Howard End song, you know, is this the death of language? That's mm -hmm. a great line. And that album seems to be—I mean, it's a—it's a dark record, and it's—it's—it's. Yeah. It's, it's, but it's one of the—I think it's one of the easier accessible records compared to the last few. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, um, I do. I—I I mean, the other ones are a little—they're—they're—they're they're, they're, they're more musically abstract. Whereas I think this one is quite—it's—it's it's, it's a, a bit more angry. It's angry, but it's—but but somehow it's not as—it's uh, not as harsh on the ears for me. Yeah. Uh, no, I understand. But uh, see, I read a, I read some reviews. How come reviewers always get everything wrong? I read a few reviews where they go, where they go, a couple said the same thing. Oh, the first half of the album, it's, it's front end loaded and it kind of weans off at the back. But it was, but it was towards the back of the album, like halfway through. Then I started to go, man, I'm really getting into this, right, right. The uh, and then I read all the comments, and there are, there are tons of them were going, these are my favorite songs, and they're all back end. That all against all song. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. All Against All is a really nasty song. The nasty. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that middle section where it's like shamanic. Yeah. Oh, with like, the throat singing. Yeah. Man, I, I loved it. That's when the record really started to sink into me. I found I could, uh, I found I could just do that. And I was like, where does this come from? I can just do this. So we started. And then I, it's in the key of the that whole bit in the middle. But yeah, All Against All is, and uh, it's about playing 
this is the this is the horrific song. Like it's uh. it's in a sense that what it's saying is that every street you've ever walked in, every ancient city has run with blood, um, and that that is the uh, that's that is the ultimate human nature. Um, and it's playing a character who's mocking faith. He's mocking the new age, um, you know, um, pagans. He's mocking the religious. He's going, it all will just end like that every time forever because well, that's the nature <laughs> of humankind. And so it's saying all against all forever, there always will be, your streets will run with blood. And um, because I was in Turkey and I was in um, some Balkan countries and every, I was doing this trip a few, just after lockdown, and every city I went to where I looked up the history was like the siege of something in 1582 and the, the this, and there's the hanging square and there's the whatever, and you just went, that's just what we do. So I went, I'm going to write the most horrific song, which is just designed to just go, no hope forever. Um, and so that's... <laughs> that's it's, it's, I don't know why I was saying about me. I was like, oh, I think this is my favourite one. I, <laughs> I had... <laughs> But, I hadn't read the lyrics yet, but I was like, all oh, right, right, okay. Now, now I've got another thing to pile on top of it. All oh, right, now we've got the lyrics. <laughs> the lyrics are brutal, but the lyric, but the whole point was that it was to play a character yeah, right. who, who is mocking. He's mocking. He's going, where is your Ragnarok? Which is like to all the new age pagans, where, where's, where's, where's your end of the world? Where's your millenarian prophecy? Or where's, where is it? It's not coming. When, even the end as you preached, it isn't coming. So, I mean, how it ends is like, it's not, it's a dark record, but it's, it's kind of kind of rebellious um, spirit to it, which is kind of like, well, we've lost the war. We might as well throw it in and go down fighting. Um, it's not without complete hope, but it's sort of, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of addressing, um, I suppose, it's asking a question like, who are the rebels left? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that first track, how it ends, the opening yeah. track. Yeah. Those lyrics, those lyrics are fantastic. Great clip, yeah. and Killian, Killian, a friend of mine, he helped make Exonum clips. He made the clip. I like it. I like the clip. It's awesome, yeah. And that, that the line which is, um, "How did it feel when they called your name for the last time?" and all that kind of stuff. And, um, again, I suppose it addresses the idea that people have sort of willingly hand over, um, what have been historically hard fought, free, hard fought freedoms. And I said, I was arguing with a friend of mine. I said, the most important word in any language is liberty. And he said, no, it's love. And I said, what if you love something that's evil? He was like, hmm, I suppose. I said, it's liberty. It's the pursuit of every um, indentured slave, every man and woman throughout history. It's the pursuit of intellectual, moral, physical, um, geographical liberty. And so the album is kind of revolves around the concept of how do you deal uh, with liberty and that word and what it means? And we're living in a, an era where we're lurching and towards authoritarianism, but people are willing it into their lives. <clears throat> oh, and so I know I can't believe it. I'm like, what? what? And it's yeah. interesting you say liberty because Jordan Maxwell, he he might even say freedom above liberty, because yeah, he used well, to say, he used to say the Statue of Liberty is is it's not freedom, which is why it's on an island off the mainland, and which is why sailors get liberty from ships, right? Which is which is you're still under authoritarian rule, but someone's granted you some liberty yeah. instead of having actual freedom. You know, the reason I use liberty is because if you use freedom, um, it's a bit more analogous, and it you brings into account questions of free will. Yeah, yeah, um, have some complicated philosophical ideas or. Um, issues with and how it relates which i haven't quite figured out but liberty seems to be to me more defined i know what you're um, saying about trying to get has, freedom sorry yeah sorry it has a historical precedent that's that should be baked into our political system like you know liberty egalite fraternity or whatever you want to say you know the measure of the french revolution and so which was of course uh, theoretically at the start i mean this is the you know the the peasant class rebelling against the monarchical system of divine right of inheritance whatever you want to say and so the idea that are we just too decadent and you know uh suckled at the teat of um you know um obedience to be able to understand that we're lurching towards an authoritarian um society and like I said, um, the idea that people who want to consider issues of liberty and freedom are somehow, you know, the the state is convinced, or whatever the state, well, <laughs> are, 
the enemy. And so, again, it comes back to what we talked about 20 minutes ago, which was the idea that the powers that be, whatever we want to call them, I don't know, the 1%, the political elite class, yeah, yeah, are just yeah, using yeah. classic divide and conquer tactics. And so they've hoodwinked people into going, here's, you know, what does that J.P. Mencken says, the average man doesn't want freedom, he wants to be kept safe. And so um, this is where we are. And so for my, whatever my small drop in the ocean is, um, it, the album is a rebellious album. No, big time. Uh, which asks the question, you know, is this really what you want? Is this really where we're going? And like, like I said, if I, if, if this be the last <laughs> mountain we have to, you know, climb up creatively or musically, well, then, you know, I made my metaphorical uh, last stand, I suppose. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, and I think the, the metal scene needed a rebellious album, at least how I saw it. It needed a, you know, a, of an album, you know. And so that's what that's what that's what we made, you know. Oh, it's but, brilliant! I love it. It's it's my, it's my favorite out, out, out of the, the the last few, really. Yeah. Which is funny. yeah, I I find it just, it's so it's so. God, what's the word? It's always it's, I love watching people try and review primordial, describe primordial albums. Always going, it's like uh, sort of. Uh. <laughs> well, I, I think like I, I've read a few descriptions, which is like. It's like sort of going back in time to be stood on a, a windswept hillside in like 1850s Ireland with like, you know, the sea, you know, sort of <laughs> spray lashing up in your face, realizing, um, you know, you're 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 end, at the end of your days. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's, I'm it's, at the end of my days. Trouble. Great. Great <laughs> yeah, I think great it's a mixture of like. Um, you know, tragedy and might, and I mean all the great things we love about heavy metal. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, you know, if if people want to get into whatever the album is about, um, then they can. Um, but it's also also you know yourself, Steve. Some songs are not they're not imbued with huge deep meaning. Like there's one of the songs which I just wanted to get across. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. It's somewhere four or five. It's the one with the video for it, and I just wanted to get across the message of or the idea that. People have been setting out in boats for distant shores they didn't know forever. A bit sort of like, not quite a migrant song, but an idea that, you know, X amount of people set out in this boat. And this is the idea of like, here comes a shore of a land you have no concept of or no knowledge of. And you're about to come across another peoples. And just that, you know, you know um, an ancient port upon which no uh, feet will ever something. I can't remember the name, my own lyrics. But I just want it like, it's just a, a, a like a sight and a feeling. There's no... People have said to me, oh, this, yeah, is your, right, like, right. this is your pro-migrant song. And I said, well, if that's what it means to you, then that's OK. Maybe it is. It's just about the constant nature of movement of people across seas and the idea that imagine being on that boat um, after being at sea for three months and arriving at Plymouth Rock or maybe Australia, maybe, you know, or wherever. And, you know, as you say, um, seeing the indigenous well, people. You almost, you almost get small tastes of that when you first start touring, you know. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it, you totally do. You know, you're in a van and you go, great, you know, I'm going to go here. I've never yeah. been to Switzerland and get out and sleep in in a yeah. barn and play yeah. metal, and which is the other well, great thing about being yeah, underground. That's, yeah, that's the beauty of, that's the beauty of touring. That's the beauty of traveling, the beauty of seeing other cultures and people and yeah. countries. Um, Realised, I mean, I was always obsessed with the idea that um, you've only got so many spins around the ball of dirt. You've only got, uh, there's all, you know, the, the law of diminishing return states that even our conversations, uh, we've many we've had over the years. There's a moment where they they are finite, and so so is <laughs> music being so, so is you know. I, so I'm I'm kind of like death obsessed in the sense that. <laughs> yeah, well, sorry, sorry to laugh there, and I'm not laughing at what you're talking about. I'm laughing to get certain things are finite. I thought that's my sex life. I've reached that stage. <laughs> Because as, as, as I said to my uh, family one day, I don't even think I've ever had any. But but there was a but there was I said to my friend one day, you remember the first time you had sex with a girl? I went, yeah, okay. You do know there will be the last time you have sex. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. I said, I think mine is here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I think it happened five years ago. Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly it. And that's I'm sort of obsessed with like I no, I am totally obsessed with hey, TikTok, time running out. You better do all these things. You better get to play in Buenos Aires. 
and you better get to South America. And you better get, you know, you need to do these things before the sand in the hourglass runs out. And yeah. and that's a sort of like, that's sort of what Kiss keeps driving me all of the time. Now, other people go, I have plenty of friends who go, they don't even notice the, really the passing of time. They go, oh, yeah, we're 50 now. It's like, yeah, tick tock. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just I just feel like relentlessly driven by the pursuit of of constantly trying to just make or do something or um, to, there had to be something happening every three or four months or I'm just completely and utterly restless, um, you know, which is why I went, you know, mad. And I was going to say, which is why <laughs> during that, that lock up, you uh, ended up into getting into a, into into sarcophagus. <laughs> that was 1987. But yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> no, but I mean. <laughs> It's more why I almost, you know, ended up like, um, well, I, I mean, I lost bits of whatever part of my mind was left to lose, I suppose. <laughs> but I got some of it back. <laughs> yeah. So here's what I wanted to ask you about, too, because I you know, I love some primordial video clips. And I think my favorite, even though not my favorite song, I have to admit, is, is that Babel's Tower video clip. Well, now, that yeah. was made by Gareth Averill. So is that the guy that's connected to your uncle, Steve? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's his son. His son, yeah, right. That's my cousin. He's the guy I made the April Men uh, music with. That video is quite old now. It's like 10 or 12 years I know, old. but it's brilliant. Yeah, well, Babel's Tower was the construction, I mean, in biblical terms, wasn't it? Not the construction of a a tower and didn't God um, have different, different nations or uh, peoples working on it who couldn't speak the same language and it's yeah that's something it. like that the, the, the conspiracy thing is that 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 eu building is in the uh, okay. shape of babel's tower and <clears throat> yeah maybe but so. without the meaning of the song i just yeah the video clip is stunning well that's when we had uh, you probably had four times the budget you do now to make videos. i was gonna say there's, there's some budget on this one yeah it's when it's when there was more physical sales more money more everything and so you got four or five thousand euro whatever it was to make one clip uh, whereas now you have to make like three for two and a half. Or it's you know the downsizing of your dreams, Steve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so where was that filmed? Because it's so well shot. I love it. It's up in the Wicklow Mountains, just near the Sally Gap. Right. Um, yeah, no, I mean I, the new videos are great as well, but that one has yeah, yeah. more time and space and editing and stuff on it. And then the bit in the middle with the magic mushrooms and um, you know Paul is sort of burying a version of me. And um, yeah, it's. Um, well, it's, you were, you, were, you were, sorry. You and Paul always seem to be in the, yeah, in the clips. No, no, like, yeah. No, in the... But you two, you two look like the. You two have very character-driven faces. I, I sometimes I watch them and I just go, these two could be actors. It's great. Paul's very good too. It's great. Yeah, he's great. Uh, but also, Exile Amongst the Ruins, where he gets to shoot me, and I'm the English soldier coming back after the First World War to England to Ireland. I, I love this video. I think it's a brilliant video. Yeah, it's a great and one too. Many views as it should have. I thought that song would be. A bit of a bigger song. Um, I thought the video was great, and the, in, the, in the video, him and Johnny from uh, Malthusian and Conan, and uh, the great Dave from Cleave are um, they're like the the IRA guys, and they catch mm. me, they execute me, and it's a it's a brilliant video. Um, and yeah, it it deserved some more views, to be honest with you. But uh, making videos, I don't, I don't necessarily enjoy the process. I'm, I think I'm a bit uh, my attention span isn't the greatest. But and because like it's there for people to see, I enjoy it that it's a, a it's reasonable work of art. But yeah, yeah. It, it's, um, and I have to sort of tie in with the music and have some sort of resonance. But I, I'm not a I'm not a movie guy. I'm not a I'm not I'm I'm more into the you know the touring and the playing live and the recording and stuff. So Paul is very into it. He yeah, really, right. cool. And he looks like he does. Yeah, you know? it's brilliant. So, um, he has an epic face. So, yeah. yeah, it's, um, yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but, yeah, it's um, Babel's Tower. It's just like, a, it's a real simple song. It's just an apology because it's about misunderstanding of language. Um, and so we thought that was going to, again, be a big song from the album, but other songs ended up being bigger. And that's the thing is, you know, when you know what it's like. You're in the middle of making the creative process, in the middle of making a record, and you think, oh, this, these are the three big songs. And then people who love the record go, oh, why didn't you pick those two? And then, Three months later, six months later, you go, oh, yeah, I see that point now. Like, there's a song <laughs> and a new, nothing new under the sun that I see now should have been one of the singles. Yeah, well, the, I did find uh, the the Thousand Fathers, was the, the Victories, a Thousand Fathers 
to yeah. feed none or something. It's, I found that one. I did, I did think other songs. I thought that that song could have gone before that one being a. Yeah, I mean, I, I nothing you want to sun is that gong 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 with the sort of chunky rhythm yeah. guitar that has the big chorus in it. And realistically, everyone who listens to the album goes, "Oh, that's one of, if not my favorite song." You go, okay, maybe we should have made. It. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but you're in the process. It's you know, it's hard to. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, like you must know when you're trying to write a joke and you're thinking this is going to kill it, uh, and and then you do it, and then oh, I've had jokes where I go, oh, this is going to be great, and then they go out there and you just do them, and just and then I'm going out there when I've got a great crowd or I'm on, on, in in that creative space, and I'm just I'm just I'm just rabbiting on. I made up that thing about Greta Thunberg. I just said on stage out of the out of the blue, right? Like like, and then I've written this joke. Oh, this is going to kill, and then uh no, I'm not impressed with that one. Like, oh, no. I thought that one would work, but yeah. So, so what are your plans? And also, Mick left, didn't he? Yeah, Mick left. Yeah. Why? Why was that? Oh, what a bummer! I think Mick um, just sort of fell out of love with being in a band. To be honest, um, Mick is Mick. Work... Oh, sorry for people listening. Mick is the uh, was the other guitarist. Yeah, he'd been there for like twenty one, two years. Um, I mean, I don't want to put words in his mouth. We didn't address it in in any press thing because. It's not really a primordial way to make big, you know, eulogies or big statements. So we don't really do any statements, but he just sort of quietly stepped aside. He didn't, he didn't, he just, when we went around to making the album, he just says, I don't have any songs. We said, look, you know, Storm Before Cam, you're in the band. You don't play on that record either. I said, you can just step out. And I mean, look, if he wants to step back in, maybe in a year or two, you know, I, I, yeah, great, great. Into the door closed personally, but maybe he does. I don't know. Um, I think that he just got sick of being in airports, being in fields with tons of people, being in a backstage. It, it, sometimes it just runs its course. And, oh, uh, mate, I know it. I know it. It can, uh, you know. If you've, run, if you've run out of energy for people and time, and just you just you kind of it's become a chore, and you're like, yeah. oh, airport call and blah blah. You have to still want to be getting on a plane to go to Mexico City, yeah. and not be like, you know what, I just want to go home. Um, yeah. And so I've never lost the every weekend that I'm not somewhere else feels like a weekend wasted for me. I'm like, if I'm sitting at home for three weeks, I'm like, I need to be gone somewhere. Yeah. Like, um, so, but I yeah. think he, well, I remember that. That's when he used to go, I'm going to do the, I'm going to do the merch for this band so I can get yeah. on tour and just go out, you know? Yeah. Well, he used I to do Marduk and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Nile. And I'd worked for lots of bands and mortal yeah. and Royer. I think he just, he just kind of fell out of love with it. So yeah, yeah, yeah I understand. Fairness, rather than drag it out and drag it out, he just went, you know, I'm just going to, I'll just step aside. So. And maybe just have a rest, as you said. I think that's what happened to Ventor. He ended up back in Creator. I think he's finally thought, I got I don't want to do this anymore. Then took about two years off and went, oh, no, I think I do. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is that for people, some people said, oh, the band looks a bit different live now. And I go, well, look, what are you talking about? I mean, the band's been going 33 years. Of course, of course, we look different, you know. And there's nothing you can do to stop the aging process and the Reaper, you know. They're, he's Well, Jerry's in there now playing guitar, isn't he? Playing guitar at the moment. And we've another lad called Shawnee who helps us. So if you look, if you're longing for that iconic blondie on one side, black haired fella on the other, um, look, you know what I mean? It's. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think you understand primordial. No, oh, and also you don't, you know, we don't have time machines. We're we can't stop the aging process. So, um, it is what it is, you know. I know it's funny how you age, and you don't really notice it. Then I see pictures of me when I first moved to Ireland, and I go, "Yeah, oh my god, I look like a teenager." I'm like, <laughs> it's so funny you say that. I just got I just got a picture of today. Dara sent him. Dara from Invictus, our mutual friend, sent me a picture of. I think it's me, him, our friend Dave, and the guys from Rotting Christ in like '96. And like gaunt little guys with like long hair and like stupid magician <laughs> beards and stuff. The magician's beard, that stupid like pencil. What is this? <laughs> yeah, I know. I've got early eighties photos where I actually used to cut the cut the fringe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what's going on here? I, I Look like anyone ever even speak to us. Look like I the mean, guitarist from Man of War, you know, that second <laughs> the worst yeah. hair on earth. <laughs> Yeah, just out of pity. Steve Hughes and bangs. I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this has been ex excellent. Do I have anything else I want to ask you? We've had a good time. We've got up to how it ends. Uh, are you, are you going to do another record, do you think? Uh, 
Because some people are speculating that how it ends is basically uh, is yeah. this our, our primordial bow out. But yeah, so that's why I, that's why I did it, just to give people something to talk about. No, I don't think the end is. The no, end I don't, do I? Certainly. I am conscious that these were in the last few chapters. Um, it's been 30 odd years, 32 years, 10 albums, um, 33, 30, whatever it is, 33 and a third. Um, certainly, um, there's a moment where you get to where you must have done the same thing where you realize like, oh, the body, main body of your career is now in the rearview mirror. And that's an unusual thing to realize. Um, and maybe at 42, 43, you didn't realize it, but now, Creeping up on 50, it's becoming more evident, like, hey, TikTok, you're in the last couple of years of this. So I'm very um, thankful and gracious of like, oh, brilliant, we're going to, uh, you know, I still love traveling and going to play gigs and I still feel brilliant. And, you know, you look at the lads and we're like, look at the thing we've created for whatever it's, you know, <clears throat> the thing we've created and you're standing on stage in Sao Paulo or, um, you know, wherever you are. Um, so I still find that beautiful, but there'll be a day will come where you go, I think this might be the last one. So I don't think this is the last album, um, but I called it How It Ends to, to kind of maybe cryptically insert some um, jeopardy into the record. <laughs> so, so, is it the end of the band? Some journalistic controversy in the in the metal yeah. world. Um, which doesn't care anyway. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this has been right. excellent. This has been, well, I think that we've been about an hour and a half. I think that's wow. A, if you got through to the end of this, brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I, I hope you'd enjoyed this. I've enjoyed it, Al. It's been great. And I'll, I'm coming over there probably about June. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll be here. So you make sure you got the uh, sarcophagus on. And uh, <laughs> that's that's a position I see me, folks, when I go out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All awesome. right, buddy. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed this, folks. And thanks again, Al. We'll it. see you soon.